What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the conversation series. I have a very special guest here with me today. I have Jeff Totes. And if you are a Dallas Stars fan for the last six years and you watch any videos and you hear Totes, this is the man behind the camera in all videos and social media. Um, but I'm going to let him introduce himself and we'll get going. Yes, what's up? Uh, my name is Jeff Totes, or as everyone says, just Totes. Um, I'm a video production nerd and I've worked for, I've gotten to utilize those skills with the Dallas Stars hockey team for the past five years. Uh, really lucky to have been affiliated with them and get to do travel with the team and shoot a lot of videos. Um, a lot of stuff that's been on social media, the web, the Fox Sports Southwest broadcast. And so that was, I've been doing that since 2015. Before that, I was at Texas A&M. And now I'm at Valley Sports Southwest doing some NBA feature producing for the Mavericks and Pelicans, which I'm really excited about. I found out about you through kind of like the different episodes that were that Dallas Stars produces and then the documentary, of course. But I first want to jump into just your overall story of like, how did you get into videography and into sports videography to be more specific? Yeah, so in starting in high school, actually, I was very into just shooting and editing video, um, bought a camcorder, worked with a friend who had a MacBook with Final Cut and we started a YouTube channel that was just a lot of like dumb sketch comedy stuff. And that was a great way to learn shooting and editing and kind yeah. of develop that passion. And then while at Texas A&M, I was lucky my sophomore year to be accepted into their 12 man productions program, which is like the creative arm of the athletic department um, as a student worker. So from sophomore to senior year, I got to shoot and produce features, work in the control room, work camera for all their sports, stuff like that. So really having access to the best equipment and a great network of professionals there. So that was three years to develop those skills while attending college. And that ended up translating to uh, the full-time gig with the Dallas Stars. So it was really awesome the way it worked out. And yeah. I'm originally from Dallas and then by chance ended up, ended up back here for work. So it's really nice. Nice. Now, what year did you graduate from Texas A&M? 2015. Okay, so you were there during the crazy, like, crazy football time with- Yes, so got to be kind of at the epicenter of that, which was awesome, because it was yeah. such a unexpected, just meteoric rise. Yeah. And to be able to be on the media side of that was really fun, yeah. and it was awesome. That's awesome. Um, do you remember the first camera you ever had? Yes, uh, <laughs> Sony HDR CX 500B. And I know because it was like, I was saving up for it for months, like yeah. looking at it, watching YouTube reviews, like that was the grail at the time. Yeah. Um, it was, it was, yeah, it was 800 bucks at the time. And it was like a, so it was months of working at the country club, saving up for that. Yeah. And then it, yeah, buying that was so exciting. Um, and I, I still have it actually, because it's so awesome. it's sentimental. <laughs> I still have. I still have my, I started in photography mm -hmm. and was always the person like on family beach trips and everything. Like I always had the care in my hand and I still, my mom just found it and she gave it to me. So I have it. And it's just sitting with all my camera gear. I was like, I can't do anything with it, but it's just like, I can't throw it away or do like, I love it. It's such an attachment. Yes. Yeah. So it's, it's one of those things where I'll probably just carry around with me for the rest of my life, just because it holds so many memories for me. Um, I love asking different videographers because I nerd out on camera gear. Like what is your go-to gear and what is kind of like your favorite camera and lens to use? Yeah, I've gone entirely Sony based um, for the past, since graduating college, honestly. Okay. With the launch of the A7 line, yeah. it, like that became the standard for having one camera that can do photo and video. So I got an A7S II in like 2016 and I still use it. Like that has been the camera. I've had to get it fixed a couple of times. I had to have some cosmetic yeah. um, touch-ups, but the A7S II has been like old faithful for honestly five years of yeah. star shooting, personal shooting, freelance, um, photo and video. And then since I've added the A7R4 for just photography yeah. and it's, so ideal that the lenses are interchangeable between those. Um, so the, the A7 along with the 24 to 70 G Master lens is just 
like uh it's kind of like the default combo for so many people now that it's yeah. not unique to say that because it's yeah. so common but yeah. um it's tough to beat in terms of versatility yeah. i love the the 24 to 70 is one of my favorite because i mean there's such a wide range you can go to there um but i'm i'm a sony person too when i kind of first started getting really serious i had somebody tell me so i have like the a6400 yeah um, and i love i love that camera just because of how clean everything truly looks and everybody was like you cannot get any more of a better picture than the sony right now and they've just stayed on top with every new camera they have coming out truly and that that a6000 line is like what i always recommend people are kind of yeah. like looking for um to take the next step photography yeah. wise um but yeah and then the fs5 is was my primary video camera every mm -hmm. year with the stars and that's like a larger bodied video camera but it's still yeah. the same e-mount so you're switching lenses between the a7 and the fs5 and it's just uh, simplifies your kit but also shoots like broadcast quality video so yeah. it's it's really tough to beat sony right now yeah couldn't agree with you more um you kicked it off with the stars you announced at the end of this last season after six years you're going to bally southwest but your time with dallas like that was a good amount of time with them correct me if i'm wrong you applied for the job didn't know a thing about hockey yeah that's correct and i didn't really like apply for any job i got lucky to be put in contact with their director of marketing at the time literally via twitter um which in 2015 wasn't as common as it is now to like have someone slide in your dms professionally <laughs> and so just by chance made that connection and they they told me in 2015 like we don't have any openings but we can pay you this amount to work three days a week and home games and so since i could live with my parents in dallas it was like financially viable yeah. and i was like oh even this amount of money to make videos like of course yeah. and then fortunately that i like doing that and been passionate so that translated to working hard and getting a full-time offer from them yeah. the following season um right. so definitely not the typical application and interview employment story but yes i didn't know any hockey going into that do you know a little bit more now do you understand <laughs> a little bit more now <laughs> yes i feel very like i could confidently break down film on anything okay. based on where i'm at now sweet good crazy yeah yeah <laughs> um your time with dallas what is kind of i know it's like so hard to pick but like, what is the thing that you're going to take away from your time with the Dallas Stars? That's tough. The um, getting to travel with the team is such a unique camaraderie and everyone's kind of in this grind together. Yeah. And it's something you hear guys talk about when they retire, that they're going to miss the bus, the flights, yeah. the locker room. And I mean, I got to be like a tiny part of that ecosystem, but even playing the smallest role in it and getting to be on the bus and the flights and sometimes in the locker room yeah. is definitely something that was, um, it feels like a grind when you're in it. And yeah. then I know next year when I watch a big road win, I'm going to think about how fun it'll be post game and like uh, definitely miss that. So that's, that's probably the biggest like long-term takeaway from that time. Kai, I'm a huge fan of sports documentaries and kind of capturing really impactful moments in sports you kind of created this incredible we're not going home documentary which i'm sure people have asked you so much about this and what bubble life was like but i'm i'm super curious like how that concept came to be was it planned out at all did it like did you have any knowledge of what it was kind of kind of look like before you went in kind of i mapped it out basically that um we would have to go past the first round to do yeah. anything and maybe if we lose in the second round we do like a 15 minute bubble wrap up and maybe if we go to the conference finals and lose it's 20 or 30 minutes yeah. and you don't really want a game plan past that um because yeah. it seems so crazy and yeah. honestly like with how um if you remember like the way the bubble started for the stars with how bad the round robin was yeah. and then how bad the calgary series started i was like my footage will never be seen because there's no contact like 
yeah. putting out a video after the fact when we get bounced by Calgary isn't going to be received well. So right. I felt very like, and I reached out to people on the star side back at the office and was like, Hey, I'm shooting everything. Like we got great footage, but yeah. there's nothing for it. If nothing comes of this. And then as we know, it turned around and went almost the distance. And so then as it kept building, it was, um, and then really after the game seven win against Colorado, it was like, yeah. okay, there's, there's something here yeah. um, that will be long form. And then after the fact, it was like, all right, let's do a solid hour long doc. And for people who don't know, we're not going home was kind of, it was carried along through the the last couple of rounds but i'm sure if you're a hockey fan you've seen doby in the locker room and he turns around and he's just like we're not going home and you hear everybody screaming that is kind of like one of the things that i'm sure everybody remembers from that but what is something that you will remember from that time in making the documentary um the one thing that i'll take from the bubble the one moment that will stick with me it's kind of like a mundane or small type thing but um after they beat vegas in game five to clinch the western conference yeah. title obviously like the dentist shot in overtime is great all that but like i was so focused on shooting and like um you're kind of not in it and then i went back to the locker room everyone's celebrating shoot that and the moment i was handed a uh, shirt and hat which is like something you see growing up as a sports fan on TV, like the locker room, Western yeah. Conference champion shirts. And like, it's oh, yeah. something you're, you'd you never be a part of. And I, I wouldn't be a part of that if it wasn't in the bubble. Yeah. Um, but let the, but to be handed that, a shirt and a hat with Western Conference champions is like, okay, I appreciate them letting me feel a part of this. And yeah. that's truly a moment that I won't forget. Now, being with that team for six years, you, we get to the last round, we lose to lightning that last game with all the emotions that was not, I mean, it wasn't easy for any fan to watch. What was it like emotion wise for you to like be there and have having to be capturing that? Yeah, it was, it was tough. Um, especially cause it kind of built the whole game. There wasn't really a moment in the game where it felt like, uh, even though this team, the whole bubble run was never out of it. Yeah. That game just felt like they're not going to climb this hill. This is this group is um, kind of maxed out, and they truly did max out in that run. But yeah, so shooting that game was rough, and then you're thinking through the logistics of like how much you have to pack, and like we're going to be out of here tomorrow, and all yeah. that. Um, but shoot, it didn't really hit till like being in the room for the post-game press conferences. Yeah. Um, obviously you see all the guys pain and what you don't see is in that room in Edmonton, it was like a podium where the guys are sitting yeah. and above them. It's like a 10 foot by 20 foot rectangular screen made up of a lot of TVs. And okay. they were broadcasting the lightning celebrating like literally 10 feet above these guys' heads. And it was just like the most like poetic bummer. Um, yeah. It was kind of, it all hits then. And then obviously Jamie sitting there not being able to speak was just like, this, this hurts. But at the same time, it makes it, I don't know, it gives value to that whole journey and makes you kind of appreciate sports. Yeah. It, it is very poetic, especially when you see your captain act like that. I mean, you know how hard they have worked. So to see your captain be that emotional, you know that there, everybody had everything they had in those games. So it was, it was super emotional to watch just because you knew after, like after when the documentary came out, you knew what had happened already, but it was it, just to see it culminate and kind of see it from that side. It was super like, it was like the, it, the final closure that we kind of got to see it all. Yeah. And the other weird part that didn't, that was just as emotionally poignant was the next morning uh, kind of like the Canadian guys got to stay in Canada and go home. Yeah. Everyone else, we were on a bus to the airport. So it's kind of like a lot of goodbyes and like separation. And then yeah. once we get back to Dallas, guys kind of say quick goodbyes. A couple guys are like talking about golfing, but it was just like such a end of summer camp type feeling where it's like, this was something really special and this yeah. group will never be yeah. together again. So it was like a weird, bittersweet, like we all shared this for 66 days ate yeah. every meal together, everything. Yeah. And now everyone's going their separate ways and they'll never be 
this group of 51 again. So that was like where I was more emotionally like poignant. And I think, I think to that point as well, like that's the kind of strange thing to kind of think about with sports is like, to your point, that whole, that Dallas stars team was not the same team that came like Seggy had surgery, a bunch of guys had surgery, so they weren't playing. And even this year, now you're going to have a ton of new guys coming in as well. So yeah. it, it is a strange thing about sports, but it, I think it's also the beautiful thing. You cap, you have these memories with a specific year of team, and then you're exactly. going to have another set of memories. So, um, right. And you'll never have that specific group again. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy to kind of think about. It um, is. Yeah. Um, the shirt you're wearing right now that Stephen Johns kind of drew with a Sharpie on yeah. a t-shirt and it turned into something like absolutely crazy. I reached out to you about this kind of when y'all were starting. Yeah. Um, Mental Miles, he texts you, says, I'm going to go rollerblade across the US. Yeah. Your response <laughs> and like, how did this all come to be? It's funny because I got your email on the flight to Pittsburgh when I was going that Saturday and we left Monday morning yeah. and I was like, uh, I saw the email. I was like, oh yeah, I'll do this. But like, we'll have a lot more to talk about in a couple of months. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was pretty wild. Like Steven's a good friend of mine, obviously met through the stars. Um, every stars fans kind of familiar with his story and what he's been battling these past couple of years. It's been a really, really weird couple of years, honestly, um, with what he's been going through and the way that's been um, addressed and talked about. So, I mean, we had talked about it and we always knew, obviously I knew there was a bigger story here. And at yeah. some point post-retirement, he's going to want to tell his full side of the story um, yeah. because there wasn't, there's no time for that. Like while he's still right. a player and stuff. So I, I, I let him know that and he appreciated it and was like, we'll talk down the road. And yeah. then we had honestly been brainstorming a summer trip and talking about maybe going to national park, hanging yeah. out, doing something. Uh, and then he reached out to me with this idea to rollerblade across the U.S. Yeah. And it, it worked out so fortuitously because it's a time where I just finished work with the stars and I didn't start working for Bally until this week, until August 1st. Nice. So I had two and a half months where I was just going to hang out for the summer, take some trips, chill. And so it was really the only time in my life I could have done something like this. I was like, all right, I have four weeks. Like I can do it in that amount of time. And so, yeah, he reached out to me with that idea. I flew up to Pittsburgh five days later and then we left two days after that um, on June 14th. So it was crazy the way it came together. And then it was not something we ever, I mean, anyone can tell, like we didn't put any effort on the front end into right. like branding it or yeah. doing anything with like partnerships or anything. Yeah. Cause it was, something we wanted to do where we're like, we're going to shoot this documentary to tell his story right. and we're going to have a fun road trip. And, you know, we'll see if some people want to follow along, but it, it took off in the first couple of days and after his initial post about it, um, which was so cool. So then it was a scramble to like recalibrate and be like, all right, we should capitalize on this because it's really doing a lot for a lot of people, which was so cool. And so y'all started in Pittsburgh and yep. went all the way to Oregon, correct? Yep. yep, over the course of three, three and a half weeks. Nice, okay. And so, and I think the coolest thing about hearing about this was not only what was the, the overall rollerblading through states, but it was kind of the, um, the pointed out, the conversations you and Steven had at night, like those are a lot of, that's a lot of time you guys are spending together and a lot of time that you're just sitting and listening to each other from a mental health standpoint, like, was there a moment where you're like, okay, this is what mental health actually really is, is like actually listening to people. Like, did it give you a yes. bigger meaning to mental health? Completely. And one of the big takeaways that we've both mentioned is how important having tough conversations oh. is because I mean, in that amount of time, well, I had conversations with him that I've never had with my friends of 20 yeah. years. And it's just something that like, you go on a road trip, you go on a trip with your buddy and you, you don't get into this stuff. Like you're, right. it's all very surface yeah. level and fun. And this was truly, we got into it and it was incredibly healthy in that regards. And yeah. 
um, I told, I think it was Mike Heike with the stars that like, imagine you're doing a profile of someone as a journalist, you're profiling a subject and you spend 23 days within five to 10 feet of them at all times. Like, how are you going to get, yeah. how are you going to better be able to tell their story while traveling to all the places that kind of shape them, like starting in their hometown, going to their college, their first, uh, uh, minor league hockey team in Rockford right. staying with their billets in junior hockey like yeah. it was just I mean journalistically like you you can't really get something like that and then on the yeah on the mental health side yeah. we truly embrace that mantra of like have tough conversations yeah. yeah and it's like it was it was like a connecting of the dots right there and it's just like and it just kept going y'all went to some like the badlands y'all went to Yellowstone I mean it, it was really like following along on his journey which was really cool to see from like start to finish um i think the kind of the two coolest things that came out of this is one you guys have a partnership now with mental health america of greater dallas and the dallas stars foundation now to kind of keep this moving which is so incredibly cool but i think the other cool part is the amount of people that joined along with you guys Every day I was checking y'all's Instagram and Twitter just to see the amount of interaction that other people were getting and were yeah. like having their own journeys. Was that surprising to you guys, the amount of interaction that was happening? Yeah, that was the first thing that was surprising was, um, and like when we branded it Mental Miles, that ended up becoming kind of the perfect slogan to encourage people to like get your own mental miles and people really embrace that and that was cool and then on the other side was the amount of people um that just sent dms to steven like telling him their story and really opening up and um the importance and value that they took from someone from a pro athlete sharing their struggle was just so incredible like i mean he got thousands and thousands of messages of people who loved seeing someone with his platform talk about what yeah. they themselves had experienced and so that was the part that was truly overwhelming and i mean he would spend like almost every day like dedicate some time to at least just shooting back a really quick message yeah. because that that's the stuff that really made it yeah. so enriching and kind of seeing the impact you you were having not only was it probably perfect timing for him but such a perfect timing for everybody else in the United States as well, just with everything that's been going on, there's been such a highlight on mental health. So I, I, what, I mean, timing was probably highlighted so much right now, just with everything going on in the world. Yeah. We talked about that and we talked about it with different people along the way. Like everyone throughout the past year and a half has been forced to confront yeah. themselves and there's like been no escape from that and maybe if you weren't struggling with something before pandemic lockdown all that a lot of people are now and then this isolation is a real thing that's important to talk about and deal with and so really? um i think that definitely factors into the increased conversation now on mental health and it's a good thing that people are talking about it yeah I, and i think when i was reading about all of this you'd said that this was probably going to be one of the hardest documentaries, movies for you to put together. You lost a drone. How, <laughs> how are you feeling about um, like putting this together and having people see it? Yeah. So first off, toughest production environment, um, <laughs> just from the logistics of like yeah. living in a tent and trying to charge batteries and oh God, yeah. keep your gear not dusty and like, yeah. I'm such a like, um, I'm so worried about gear staying clean and stuff like that. It was just, you lose all of that because there's no chance uh, right. to separate to a sterile work environment. So, um, that took, that took some abandonment, um, on my end, but then on the second part of that's the, now on the back end editing, yeah. like we're having to, I'm having to relive some of these kind of difficult moments yeah. and it's important that they're in there and we talk through it and, He's very honest in the way he tells his story. And it, it's just tough to have to like rewatch your friend going through this again right. on camera. Um, but it is a very, it feels very important and feels definitely um, a bit more important than anything I've done up to yeah. this point. Very cool. 
The last thing I want to ask you about this, how's the tattoo, how's the tattoo feeling? It's good. It's, I'm still, still on board with it. Um, because of Texas summer, like you wear shorts every day and you're kind of forced to confront it every yeah. time you sit down. Um, they don't tell you that about above the knee tattoos. Like this yeah. will be directly, like you'll <laughs> sit on an airplane and like think about that decision for the duration of the flight. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it healed nicely and I, it still happy with it right now. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I got what it symbolizes. Yeah, I got uh, I got two this summer, and I it happened. I was living six uh, six weeks at the beach, just by myself, kind of situation. Uh, and I got two tattoos, and they're like, "Yeah, you can't go in chlorine or salt water <laughs> or anything." And I'm like, "Shit!" Terrible <laughs> like, timing. Uh, terrible timing. Thank God I worked during the week, and so I was like not out in the water as much as I usually was but I was like okay this is <laughs> this is gonna be a rough five days yeah um, it changes changes your itineraries <laughs> yeah yeah for sure um your new job with Bally Sports Southwest what are you excited about with this new job yeah I'm on day three of it right now um so I'm just doing all the like basic onboarding stuff but yeah. Um, I'm going to be working with the Mavericks and Pelicans this season, um, doing different feature producing for them, a little bit of the high school football feature producing here cool. before NBA starts. Um, I'm excited to become best friends with Luca. That's my only goal. Hey. So all I'm trying to do is just cultivate that friendship. Once that's achieved, I'm good with this job. <laughs> hey, you, that's like a check off the list. You're like, I can, you know, I can be a, I can die a happy guy right now. It's true. But no, the real thing is like, like I said, I wasn't a hockey fan going to the star shop. I very much am a Mavericks fan of my whole life and a huge NBA fan. And so I'm pumped to be able to be adjacent to this team. And now I have the years, I guess, of experience where I'm not going to be starstruck, not be like abusing yeah. that privilege. Yeah. Um, so I am pumped to be kind of get to work with the Mavs, get to take kind of this like behind the scenes storytelling, yeah. editing that I got to do with the stars and translate that to basketball because yeah. you have a fan base there that's so hungry for player content. And so I'm excited to kind of like we've literally been sending some of my stars that it's over to these teams and being like, OK, here's how we do this. And yeah. so I think there's a real opportunity there. I think. I think that is the thing that is missed out a lot in sports because I loved getting to see that look into the Dallas stars kind of world where I wished every team did it. Like hurricanes did it a little bit, but I was like, I want to see these kind of moments that we don't usually get to see. So I wish like every team kind of did it. So I'm, Seems I'm like they're moving that way. It's, yeah. it's everyone's pushing that way, which is cool. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm excited that you're going over to both those teams and doing that kind of stuff. I think it's just gearing more people to do that kind of um, video work, which is awesome. Yeah, I can't wait. And on the side, I'll be editing this Mental Miles documentary. We're hoping to have that late November, maybe. We'll see. Cool. It's like we're not locked into any schedule, which is nice, but um, want to capitalize on all that momentum Great. and positive energy. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Um, through all of your time doing all of this video work from sports to mental miles, what has been the biggest thing that you have learned about videography yourself? That's tough. Um, <laughs> probably the, the most important, most important thing in this industry is versatility and a willingness to learn. Yeah. Um, not at all trying to apply and get your dream job but right. rather the importance of getting a foot in the door and then being willing to do the work that's like yeah. maybe yeah. outside your wheelhouse because like my first year with the stars was so much just like asking every editor like what do you need and like sifting through footage and doing photoshop cutouts and stuff like that like stuff that's not at all your dream job but um right. kind of learning that versatility and um just willingness to work was what definitely what got me here you know, nice. I think, um, I'm gonna think of a better answer for that like in five hours but that's I'll go with that um what I I, I know like I'm super interested in this myself 
And so many people now are just picking up cameras and want to and are filming everything. What is kind of the best piece of advice you have for someone who is looking to pursue a career in videography? Well, that's kind of what's scary right now for me. It's like the <laughs> everybody, every kid has proficiency shooting and editing video, even if it's just TikTok, like they even understand just from this. Yeah, exactly. And it's that's some of the best stuff that's being created right now. And yeah. every kid is doing it. So like, whereas kind of the barriers to entry in the industry were higher, even just five years ago, six years ago, when I got in, where you had to have access to camera equipment and an edit suite, a laptop, whatever. Um, now we're just pushing the other way where everyone can do it. And that's exciting. That's exciting for any young person who wants to do it. Um, scary for someone who's <laughs> like trying to trying to stay in the industry. Yeah. Um, but no, I think that's the most exciting thing is that everyone has the opportunity to yeah. create. It's, it's never been cheaper, never been easier uh, right. to learn. Like some of the best creatives and creators right now are entirely YouTube taught and that's, you can learn everything you need there. There's no need for film school or the formalized classroom yeah. setting. Um, so I think that's, that's what makes right now really exciting for anyone who wants to pursue that. I think it's like the coolest thing that YouTube has become legitimately this like type of school for people like you could save yourself $10,000 or a good amount of Crazy. money just by going on YouTube and learning that way, which yeah. I think is absolutely insane. Any skill, no matter how niche or like for your specific car model to change this one piece, like there are five different oh, videos. Yeah. It's crazy. And yeah. yeah, that's something that, that is, yeah, great time for that right now. Yeah, absolutely. It, it is crazy because at the same time, you're like, somebody like me is like, okay, thinking I have to go back to school to get a good degree for something. Cause I mean, I'm 24 and I have younger cousins who are like, I'm just learning it on YouTube. Like, yeah. And I'm like, Crazy. I'm sitting here thinking about going to California to go to school for something that you are telling me right now, it's you wild. just learned on YouTube. Um, so it, it's also it, great. Yeah. yeah. Great. Opportunities I don't know. are endless. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my last question for you that I love to ask everybody, what inspires you? Um, uh, I genuinely love the process of shooting and editing video and seeing like, it sounds really corny, but I love video features because they're something that's greater than the sum of their parts. Um, just individual shots, music, interview audio, it, yeah. it, it's all individually itself fine. And, but when you put it together and synthesize it in yeah. a way that like is greater, like I still get so much from that process. Yeah. Um, and I, I'll tell you what, like I still remember the moment I like caught that was in freshman year of high school. I was shooting a video with a friend and it was like, we were pretending it was like an airplane travel story or something. So we went to Love Field, filmed an airplane through the fence yeah. and then went to my garage and set up a fake airplane interior. And so we yeah. went shot of an airplane landing and then the sound of like the fastened seatbelt ding yeah. and right on that, that cut to my garage. And it looked terrible, but like seeing that shot audio yeah. cue shot like blew my mind it was like oh okay we're filmmakers now like I still I remember it so clearly and that's the moment that I was like okay like so yeah. in on shooting and editing video and like the power of that it's it's so random but it's like I still have that excitement I I love that because I am I I this is such a nerdy thing to say but at like after you edit a video or a big project and you get to the end of it and you see the whole timeline and all the different cuts and all the different colors for all the audio and everything I sit there and I'm like that's beautiful yes that, it is I like, agree completely and no one like everyone just sees like that final yes. they just hear the final audio mix see yeah. the final videos whatever's the top layer but like you yeah. yeah the time that goes into that is like still something I love it's, it's so nuts. Cause I'll just sit there and I'm like, and I, I have another friend who, um, did stuff for NC state hockey team and him and I were talking about it. And I was like, he was like, he's like, Danielle, I love that too. And I was like, is it just all of us <laughs> it's photographers who just like love that vision? And it's just like, so satisfying in a way. Um, 
Just, yeah, it's, I think it truly is. Or I think you have to to get any further in this industry. Like yeah. you're not going to if you're if you don't have that passion and excitement. And it terrifies me to think about that that could like fade at some point. You're just like it, it's strictly a job because yeah. I'm, I'm glad to still have that. Yeah, yeah. I, I I hope it never fades, and I hope um, that you know I I love the idea too of more people being in it. But it's like you said, it scares me at the same time because I'm like you don't want it to become so saturated that everybody's doing it. Um, right, like, right. Well, theoretically that drives up the, everyone's level of quality, but yeah. like, I, I'm happy to not be in a position where yeah. my editing and shooting is based on trends where you have to yes. be like understanding what's current. Cause I'm, I'm out on that now. So yeah. it's like <laughs> glad to be on the broadcast side. That's a little yeah. bit more consistent year to year. Yeah. You don't have to be on TikTok and doing dances and things like that. Exactly. Exactly. I'm so happy with, um, because I cannot dance. Um, <laughs> I am not one of those people. I'm going to have all of Totes' uh, socials linked down below so you can guys check it out. And hopefully soon we'll see the Mental Miles in late November, hopefully. Um, I think it's a great story that we're all really excited to see and uh, really see what you guys did. Thank you so much, Totes. Thank you. That was awesome. That was really fun. I appreciate it. I will see you guys back here next time. Bye, y'all.